Good morning, everyone. I'm Muriel Bowser. I'm the mayor of Washington, D.C. I'm joined by members of my team to provide an update on the district's response to COVID-19. I'm joined by City Administrator Kevin Donahue, uh, Dr. LaQuandra Nesbitt, the Director of DC Health, and Director Chris Rodriguez, the Director of DCH SEMA. Uh, today we are providing uh, an update on um, phase two of the district's reopening posture, uh, and we will also talk about uh, some changes. We'll also talk about progress with vaccination and take your questions. Uh, as you know, uh, we update our uh, metrics related to COVID-19 on a daily basis on coronavirus.dc.gov. Uh, we're very pleased that over the last several days, uh, we have seen our, our case spread, our community spread numbers venture out of the red uh, into the yellow and fast approaching uh, the green. Uh, you might remember that our daily case rate peaked in January at 45.9, and today you can see it's down uh, to 6.6. .6. Uh, throughout this process, I have um, said how, uh, ha how proud I am of DC residents and businesses who have responded, uh, who have followed uh, health guidance and have worked together uh, to help protect our community throughout the pandemic. And uh, we see it uh, in these numbers uh, today. So over the past uh, 15 months, uh, our public health system and our team at DC Health and DCH SEMA uh, have worked um, with the entire DC government to make sure that we're putting our health system in the best um, posture possible. Uh, so we've stood up over these months COVID-19 uh, test at free uh, walk-up sites that are open across the district. Uh, and we now have at-home testing kits available at libraries across the district. Um, so continue um, to go to coronavirus.dc.gov to make sure you know where all of those testing, uh, those free testing um, information and equipment uh, is available. Uh, we have uh, also established a contact trace force and uh, I wanna continue to remind DC residents to answer the call. You might get a call like this that says DC COVID team, uh, which means you have been exposed to COVID-19 and in order to continue to have a ro our health system capacity perform at its best, uh, we need you to answer to call the call. Uh, and as you can see, over 800,000 people have also opted in uh, to an exposure notification tool. Containing the virus uh, will continue to require all of us uh, to be focused on uh, maintaining a, a robust health system. Uh, furthermore, uh, I mentioned last week, I think in a response to a question, uh, that our alternate care site um, is being dismantled and we've started that, pro that process. Uh, we're grateful to Events DC for making this very significant part of their space available. We're grateful to FEMA um, for uh, their assistance when we built this uh, facility in rather short order and the reimbursements that we will receive um, to cover the cost. Uh, and uh, we are also grateful that we never had to use it. Uh, we went into this knowing that it was an insurance policy, then if we did everything we could to keep our health system robust, we wouldn't need to use it, uh, and we didn't. Uh, we are uh, also uh, in the phase of our response where uh, vaccination uh, is needs to be on everybody's mind. Uh, since December 2020, uh, over 200,000 DC residents have been fully vaccinated, but that also means that many thousands uh, need to be vaccinated. Vaccines are free and available on demand at walk-up sites across the district. Uh, this includes the ones that DC government supports at these uh, 12 locations, uh, but many uh, uh, local healthcare providers and um, 
healthcare facilities and pharmacies are providing uh, very easy to get vaccines. So please uh, pay attention to getting uh, your vaccine. So with all this in place, we are seeing dramatic uh, improvements in our health metrics. Uh, and as you can see where we are today with the red, yellow, and green lines that I mentioned earlier, uh, we are fast approaching the green and we expect uh, with continued uh, vigilance um, that that's exactly uh, where we're going to be. Our health metrics continue uh, to go uh, in the right direction. So going forward, uh, we are going to continue to do what we need to do to keep ourselves, our families, and our city safe. And of course, workers and visitors will be uh, required uh, to follow the CDC's mask guidance. But I want to also um, t show everybody the red, yellow, and green risk analysis that the CDC has provided uh, to demonstrate how DC residents uh, can choose uh, safer activities. Uh, you will note uh, the green column on the right uh, demonstrates how people can enjoy safer activities uh, when they are fully vaccinated. And you will notice that the entire column uh, is green. Uh, you will also notice on the left side, for unvaccinated people, um, there are uh, activities that they can enjoy um, while being masked, but you see that their caution uh, activities for unvaccinated people, even when they are wearing masks uh, and even when they are physically distant. Um, the, the message here uh, is you can get back to more normal life when you're fully vaccinated. Uh, and so I want to, when we're going to make this graphic widely available, I'm going to ask you to share it uh, with your friends and family and coworkers so that all of us um, can be on the right side. Uh, and that's where we can enjoy more normal activities um, because we're fully vaccinated. Uh, so we want to emphasize fully vaccinated people uh, when wearing a mask uh, can participate um, with less risk. Uh, all of those activities listed. This is not an exhaustive list, obviously, but the CDC wanted to highlight some higher risk activities. Unvaccinated people need to be uh, and choose their activities more carefully, uh, need to wear a mask, need to uh, maintain a six foot social distance, and uh, continue to be very vigilant about hand washing. Uh, so get vaccinated. Uh, and with all of that said, on Friday, uh, May 21st, uh, we will be uh, turning on substantially more activity uh, in the district. Uh, and we anticipate on uh, three weeks following that on June 11th that we will be able um, to all turn up activity in the district all the way. Um, so restrictions on public and commercial activity, including capacity limits, types of activities, and time restrictions will be lifted except for bars, nightclubs, and large sport and entertainment venues uh, where we will have a capacity limit um, until June 11th. On June 11th, capacity limits and restricted will uh, on and restrictions will be lifted on those venues as well. Um, so uh, let me go back to the reopening table here, uh, which we'll also post. Uh, this is a high level sketch of what's to come where we will uh, formally update it uh, by way of a mayor's order. Uh, so based on upcoming changes, uh, DC Health will review uh, its guidance uh, documents uh, and those guidance documents that are very specific about venues and activities and sectors uh, will be replaced uh, by more general guidance on business operations uh, related uh, to um, 
current mask and travel guidelines, uh, disinfecting and cleaning recommendations, and how to report COVID-19 uh, uh, requirements. I also want to just give a um, to highlight that these changes to restrictions uh, not only are relate to uh, the entertainment venues uh, and restaurants that we've been asked a lot about, but also workplaces. Uh, so if you're an uh, office building tenant, uh, you uh, should know that your employees uh, can go back in their offices. And um, we that includes uh, D.C. government workers as well. Uh, so we just want to give you a kind of broad stroke um, report on what we've been working with our employees for for the last several weeks uh, and that is a May 3rd 25% uh, return many of our divisions already have that uh, number of employees reporting in person but others will go to that number uh, the first week of June uh, executive accepted and management service employees uh, will um, be uh, reporting to the office and by July 12th all employees uh, will be working some part of their week um, in person uh, in their offices and next uh, we are continuing, and I think I've already had the chance to thank uh, over a thousand volunteers who joined us on the May 1st Day of Action uh, as in the D.C. Community Corps. We're going to do it again. We had so much fun and talked to so many neighbors that on Saturday, May 22nd, uh, we're going to have our second uh, Day of Action uh, talking to neighbors and uh, about how they can go out and get their vaccines. Um, so please there were a lot of community uh, groups sororities and fraternities churches uh, you name it people came out to do some public service and i want to invite you to do it again canvassing shifts will begin at 9 a.m and 11 a.m uh, and um, we'll also be in the coming uh, days talking to you about another team of folks that we are going to put out there and support uh, who will be uh, encouraging people to go to the free dc um, vaccine um, walk-up sites thanks to uh to our uh, business community who stepped up with us to support Get Vax for Mom um, with flower giveaways from Ginkgo Gardens, Lee's Flowers, and Roots and Blooms. So thank you very much for that. Uh, this Wednesday, uh, another, uh, I know DC Health is eager to continue to support vaccine pop-ups. Uh, and we're going to do one with DC United this Wednesday, May 12th, from 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. at Audi Field. And that's located at 100 Potomac Avenue uh, Southwest. Um, and so the J&J &J vaccine will be distributed. Take your shot uh, with DC United. We can't wait to see you. Uh, we also uh, are going to support more of the take, the take the Shot vaccine efforts. And if you are are a business that wants to and, uh, encourage people to take the shot with a free giveaway, um, please contact us so that we can make arrangements with DC Health uh, to support that activity. If you haven't signed up, uh, you need to enter to win. Uh, this is a big giveaway. It's a big deal. Um, and you can make up for some missed parties uh, last year or some missed self-care opportunities uh, and uh, win the chance to support a local retailer by entering to win uh, the DC Shop Eat, Play, and Stay giveaway. Um, so. Uh, the winner, winners will get between $500 and $25,000 um, in, in giveaways to support local restaurants, retailers, entertainment venues, and D.C. hotels. So enter to win by going to ramw.org, which is the Restaurant Association of Metropolitan Washington uh, .org, um, and you have to enter to win. And so before we take questions, uh, I just want to reiterate um, how important the following will be uh, for us uh, to continue uh, to reopen our city, to get back to life. Uh, we need people to get vaccinated. 
for the people in your life and your circle of friends uh, and family who aren't vaccinated, you need to encourage them to get vaccinated, show them where they can go, take them um, with you. You need to follow the CDC mask guidance uh, and you need to practice good hygiene and you need to assess your risk, your family's risk in choosing your activities uh, wisely. There are more activities open to you when you're fully vaccinated uh, and when you're not, you're still at risk for contracting COVID. Um, and we know uh, that the level of illness and death uh, vary widely. Um, so avoid that by getting vaccinated. So with that, I'll take your questions. Sam. Uh, yes, Mayor. Uh, one of the things that uh, that I've seen is they're talking about businesses making people show a vaccination card. Is that part of this? It is not part of this. So that would be, that would be up to a business or that would be illegal? Well, uh, it's interesting that you asked that question because we think that businesses, you know, they require lots of things to enter uh, a business, but I've asked my legal team, I want to get a formal legal opinion uh, so that we can advise businesses. What we know, um, however, is that there is not a uh, official, um, if you will, way to determine if a vaccination card is valid or not. Um, so largely, if a business was asking that, it, it, they have no way of determining if it's a valid vaccination card or not. And July 12th, that, is that essentially the day when everything goes back to normal with the exception of you'll be wearing a mask? Is that... Um, if you want to go back to the, the dates that I mentioned, Sam, uh, we, we're looking at, uh, we'll go back to the chart largely, um, commercial activity is going to, um, restrictions will be lifted from those activities with the exception of bars and nightclubs, which will still have a restriction at 50% and large sports and entertainment venues, um, uh, they will continue to uh, operate in our waiver process. Um, in on June 11th, they will not be subject to the waiver process. Right. So June 11th there, but you, you listed July 12th as all employees required to be set and working in new offices. That's for D.C. government. So this is just for the government. So I guess the other. I don't. You're conflating some things. What's well, just for the government? June 12th is the, it, June, what was the date you mentioned? July 12th. July 12th yes. is related to DC. You see the top of the slide where it says DC government operating status. Okay. But I guess what, what about for um, other businesses, other entities? Uh, are, is there any suggestion here that when their people can come back or they, they can, can come, come back, back now? They can, there's nothing stopping them from coming back. And on May 21st, there will be no restrictions about their operations. But wearing masks is still... Wearing masks is still um, required. Yes. Um, Mayor Bowser, what about social distancing, particularly in venues with, you know, restaurants? You may lift the capacity if social distancing is required. That's still an issue. Will, will those, will everything but the mask be lifted? That's correct. And then what about the health emergency? When will that be lifted? Have you got a, have you looked at that date yet? We have looked at it. Um, and there are many administrative um, things uh, tied to the health emergency, including our reimbursements um, from the federal government. So the health emergency will need to be in place as long as there are um, various issues, including, and Kevin and LaCroix may have the list uh, handy of um, reasons, as long as people are responding to COVID, um, we, and even in their personal capacity, we'll have to have that in place. And then just to be clear to kind of maybe end the circle on the dancing question. So dancing will be allowed at wedding venues beginning on May 21st and then in nightclubs and music venues on June 11th? There are no restrictions. The restrictions that I listed are in that chart, Mark. I, I know, and you say, and I don't, and, but then it says, you know, that Department of Health will put out specific guidelines, and this has been an issue in the past when we've had press conference where you announce something, and then more specific detail comes out later. So I'm just trying to get as much as we can now, particularly about something like you know, the dancing band that has caught a lot of attention nationally. And, and, and so what that means on May 11th, it looks like when it says 
everything but mask lifted. That would include dancing at the music at the wedding venues and then in the music venues on July 11th, on June 11th. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Yes, sir. Good morning, Mayor. Good morning. Um, I, I had come to ask you a question about the letter that the IMP and the Monumental Sports had written, but I, I guess some of this addresses that now. Uh, was that letter at all instrumental in informing this announcement today? Did it have any impact at all? It didn't. So let me say what has the impact. Let me go back to the slide that shows the case rates. Okay, so you'll, you'll notice, um, and I give all credit, as I always have, to D.C. residents and businesses who have followed um, the public health advice. Um, and they've even outperformed where we thought they'd be, we'd be, on this date. And that's how we can get closer uh, to reopening because of the precipitous fall in our case rate. I wanted to ask you a regional question. Sure. Um, some areas like New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut, uh, in the last couple of months especially, as we have drawn down the case numbers, have worked more regionally. Uh, Northern Virginia and Maryland and, and D.C. Ha have not seemed to take that approach. W w has that ever been discussed with the other jurisdictions about teaming up on these things so there's more uniformity as people regionally here travel from jurisdiction to jurisdiction? Um, we've worked, I, I think, very cooperatively over the last uh, 15 months, uh, and I think that we've made the best decisions that impact certainly this region. Um, the states of Maryland and Virginia are bigger than this region, um, obviously, so they ha need to do some different things that impact their whole state, uh, where we've been very focused on the capital region. If I may follow, though, um, there are jurisdictions in Maryland that are not in line with the state of Maryland right now, uh, that they are more in line with what DEC is doing. So. I'm just curious, did, did that ever come up in, in jurisdictions with your counterparts at all about maybe grouping Northern Virginia, Howard County, uh, Montgomery County, Prince George's? Well, I think you just said what I said. Yeah. You said that the, some of the jurisdictions that are in the capital region align more with the center of the region, us, um, than they might um, with other parts of their state, which makes sense to us. So to answer your question um, more, uh, yes, we, I coordinate with um, the governors and Dr. Nesbitt and Chris Rodriguez and their counterparts coordinate with all the health directors and emergency operations directors, not only at the state level, um, but also at the county level. Yes. Yes, ma'am. As daily uh, COVID rates uh, continue to plummet and reopenings continue, are there any plans to change contract tracing in the city? I can speak to that. Um, no, <laughs> uh, and we contact tracing will remain a 24-7 uh, operation uh, for the duration of this pandemic. Uh, as the mayor has highlighted, we are quickly um, and, and enthusiastically approaching uh, containment of the virus in our jurisdiction. In order to be able to continue to do that and to sustain containment when we get to that level, we still need to be able to do what we call box it out, right? So we need to be able to quickly identify new cases, identify all of those close contacts, have them quarantined so that they do not spread the virus. So as we've talked a lot about contact tracing nationally as it relates to COVID-19, it's a core function of public health where we do disease investigation for infectious and highly infectious diseases. So that will remain a core part of our portfolio. And we wanna be able to sustain that seven days a week uh, so that no matter when your diagnosis comes, we can make contact with you within a day uh, and with your contacts within two days. And I have an off topic question. Uh, last week you joined the Democratic Governors Association. Um, have you spoken to any of the other governors that may not be regional or Governor Lujan Grissom? And can you talk a little bit about the process? Like, why did you join and what does it mean to be a member now? Um, well, we, we joined. Um, we are um, members of a lot of uh, national associations like that, and we have found it to be incredibly helpful. Uh, to have the staffs of those organizations uh, help us on whether it's 
uh, lobby efforts that affect cities and states or whether it's policy development uh, that they have their teams work on and, and quite frankly most recently just uh, kind of having a clearinghouse of ideas among um, people who are facing the same thing that we're facing so uh, we uh, find those memberships to be very important this isn't the first time I'm relying on my memory now, but we've tried to join the the governors associate the Democratic Governors Association before, um, and uh, we're grateful to uh, Governor Lujan Grisham for uh, admitting us. Uh, she recognizes that uh, how important that membership is, and that we, um, d you know, I, I love being mayor of my hometown, but the truth is, I'm the county executive, mayor, and governor in the job that we have to do. Um, they're not many mayors who are having um, the, the great experience of leading a state health agency that is responding to COVID in the way that we have state emergency management uh, agency uh, and uh, delivering on all of not just the vaccine and testing, uh, but also the economic relief that is so uh, much needed by our residents. So we're, we're thrilled to be in it. I haven't uh, participated in any activities yet, um, but we will be active participants. Yes, sir. Thanks. Just to get some clarity on the order that's coming, I want to make sure I understand if if this changes in any way, mandates on what people need to do in terms of wearing masks, does this affect uh, the district's mask rules at all? Uh, I don't think it affects our mask rules at all. In fact, we're emphasizing um, that in order to do these activities, some of them are high risk activities. Um, so it's, talking about masks is one thing, but vaccination, go back to our chart where you can be in, in the green here on all of those activities, some of which are high, high risk activities um, if you're vaccinated. Um, but even with vaccination, uh, the CDC uh, recommends mask wearing and that's where we'll be as well. Thanks. And then a couple weeks ago, I think you were looking at July 4th, I believe, as a date to possibly introduce some of these ease restrictions. Is your stance at this point that you could go back on this decision, for example, if metrics reverse course or if there's an introduction of a new variant, or do you feel DC has control over the virus at this point with vaccinations and with the metrics you cited? Okay, so um, do, do I think that we would have to put in business restrictions at a future date? I hope not. Um, but if we think that our health system was strained by COVID, um, we would have to. Yes. Uh, the uh, Monumental Sports has asked for a waiver for the um, playoffs that are coming this weekend. Do you know to go to 25% capacity, I believe that'll be before they would be able to otherwise open up. Do you have any indication of how you will rule on that waiver application? Um, we expect to approve a waiver. I think we have a couple um, for large venues. Uh, and we expect to um, approve their waiver. And then Dr. Nesbitt, we haven't heard from you. You've been at the front of this and I'm sure rec you know, advising the mayor on this. You know, what are your thoughts as we get to this day that so many people have been waiting for? And I know, you know not always happy with you know, some of the things you've told people ha that they have to do over the past 15 months, but you know, here we are today and I'm just kind of Wondering how you're feeling. So, Mark, I'll start by saying that um, I am often overwhelmed by the amount of support that we have received and I have received directly uh, from our community members, whether it be through email uh, and occasional bump into someone in the grocery store who recognizes me, who are extremely appreciative of the approach that we have taken over the past 16 months. Um, you know, it's difficult to make 100% of the people in the world happy. Uh, so that has never been my goal. My goal has been to protect the health of the nation's capital and to protect our residents and people who work here. Uh, in my earlier comment, uh, I already highlighted that we are fastly approaching uh, what appears to be containment of the virus in the district, which would be when our community spread uh, daily case rate is less than five. Um, it, it, you think that a lot of people have been waiting on this day. <laughs> I don't know that any more than I, um, because it's a true testament to the uh, commitment that our residents have had, our businesses have had, our healthcare workers, everybody, this, uh, we're all in this together approach uh, has paid off for us here uh, in the district. 
Uh, but in the, in the ensuing weeks, we continue to need to remain vigilant. I'll highlight it again. The mayor's already highlighted it. We'll do it a 17th time if necessary. There are risks inherent with certain activities. Uh, and while we're going to move to a next phase of our response, one we've anticipated since the mayor's advisory group for reopening submitted a report to her, uh, we still want people to be cautious. Uh, if you are not fully vaccinated, your degree of risk is still gonna be higher than someone who is fully vaccinated. The more that you want to do without a mask, the more we need people to continue to get vaccinated. Uh, we may start to see emerging groups that uh, are the only populations now affected by COVID-19. Uh, and that will be disheartening to see that people have been left behind despite all of the opportunities for vaccinations in DC and in the region. So, um, you know, I'm optimistic. Uh, I'll continue to be optimistic and have confidence and faith in our people here in DC uh, that they'll continue to do the right thing as we move into the next phase of our COVID response. Mayor if I could just have one off topic question uh, on the uh, two month old baby, Keon Jones, who was reported missing. Do you have any update on where that investigation or that search is? And then can you also comment on child and family services role with the family? Is, is there a timeline that you could release if, if they had been in touch with this family leading up to this? and? what their role is in monitoring this family, if in fact they I'm were? I'm not sure this family was under any um, monitoring, um, but I, I don't know. They are early uh, in the investigation, um, and the mother is being questioned about the child's um, whereabouts. Is the mother a suspect or in custody? She's the only person of interest. Is she in custody? She is not. Yes. Hi, thank you. Um, to follow up on what Michael was asking about, uh, I'm sure a lot of businesses and people are happy today to see things are reopening and returning to some semblance of normalcy. But I have to clarify, uh, like, is there a specific metric or how will you be deciding um, to tr put back capacity limits? How are you thinking about that in terms of like, it, is it going to be similar to the, the, the situation where there's a press conference, we're seeing a metric approach the, uh, the red again? Like, how are you making decisions on, on capacity limits being reinstated again? Or do you not expect that? Uh, we, will, we will look at the, at the health system's capacity. So not just one thing, but anything. Um, all the things um, to see how the system is performing. Understood. And it says you're reviewing health guide or DC Health is reviewing health guidance the next seven to 10 days. Does this mean you're reviewing things like seating at the bars at restaurants or the midnight curfew on alcohol? Um, Dr. Nesbitt laid out the kind of the broad, um, the buckets of activity that a, a new guidance uh, would. So she'll, Dr. Nesbitt, I'm going to turn to you in a second. Um, she'll talk about some of the, there are many guidances right now out yeah. there related to COVID. <laughs> Expect those to go away um, and there to be a more general guidance related to mask and travel, cleaning and disinfectant, and how a business uh, should report cases. So all of the very specific things about how many feet, th those things will be uh, replaced by a more general guidance. Sure, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, our approach over the past several months or the past year uh, actually has been to uh, embed risk mitigation requirements uh, in the district. Uh, in this new phase, you'll see this in DC and many other jurisdictions as we moved into, uh, we continue to have a risk mitigation approach, uh, but it's the public's understanding of their risk if they participate in certain activities uh, with the knowledge of their own status about being vaccinated or fully vaccinated. Uh, in that same vein, it is feasible for us to create an operational or COVID operations guidance document that highlights what is necessary by our policies, by the mayor's, uh, mayor's order uh, to have to do in the district, right? So we're still wearing masks. Uh, we're still wearing masks uh, uh, on all federal transportation. We're still wearing masks indoors, uh, regardless of vaccination status. And as the science around that improves, uh, we'll be able to make changes. But we're emphasizing, as the mayor said, mask, tri travel guidance, uh, travel guidelines, cleaning and disinfecting recommendations, because we know so many businesses that are opening uh, will want to hear from us. How do they keep their, their workers safe? How do they keep their patrons safe? And then the requirements to continue to report cases to the health department uh, to us um, so that we can identify, identify outbreaks where they are occurring. 
and, and Dr. Nesbitt, I remember at one of these press conferences, and it was like a month ago, but you said that we were trying to get 80% vaccinated. I wonder if, if that's still the, is, do you think, do you think that's still I, I'm in not, it? I'm not sure you heard me say that. Um, I think I've, uh, I've referenced on a number of occasions that there is public health, um, uh, gr there was public health uh, consensus as best as anyone can understand uh, that you may need to get to 70 to 80 percent to have herd immunity. But you've also heard me say here uh, repeatedly that we're not only looking at our vaccination rates. Uh, and the mayor said this to, to, to steal her phrase, we gotta crush the virus. It appears that we are crushing the virus. If we can crush the virus with a lower proportion of our population being vaccinated, why would we continue to still have so many restrictions that are intended to mitigate, right? So those are the types of decisions you ask, how are you all thinking about this? Uh, public health and epidemiology is a, is a study science. Uh, so we think about this in a very holistic perspective. And as our observations change about what's going on, we can change the environment in which our people work and live. I, I guess what I'm, what I'm still though wondering is, are you considering more, are you considering monetary incentives to try to drive up vaccinations? So that's a different question yeah. than yeah, yeah, the original yeah. question that you asked me. So oh, if you were still different. wondering that, you hadn't put that <laughs> on the table. Sorry, sorry. Um, you know, I'll, I'll defer to the mayor to speak to that, but I think you all know that there are some uh, businesses, uh, some of our healthcare facilities and providers who have already done those things, who've created incentive programs. Uh, for people to be vaccinated. Some of them are monetary. Some of them have to do with leave. Uh, some of them have to do with entering for a prize for something. Uh, and we imagine that those things will still ha want to happen. Uh, wanting to keep COVID under control is not just something that Dr. Nesbitt wants to do, that Mayor Bowser wants to do. Our entire community wants to do it. And we're seeing leaders in our community be very innovative uh, in their approaches to encourage vaccination. And we'll continue to take that all hands on deck approach. So we, we will continue to focus, as I mentioned, on getting people who haven't been vaccinated yet uh, in the queue. Um, I already talked about the community core. Uh, I've asked um, Kevin and the team to put together uh, as well. We'll have a, a strategy, a paid strategy about how to drive people to our free walk-up sites through uh, June, I guess. Um, uh, as well. So we will continue uh, to drive people uh, to get vaccinated. As the truth is, um, you saw all the risks to unvaccinated people. We know when we turn on activity, that that could also mean that more people uh, get infected. Um, and we don't want to see them in the hospital. Um, even though the, we can we can turn up activity and many things are very safe for fully vaccinated people, uh, we want people uh, to get vaccinated and we're going to drive that. Uh, we know that our community health partners are going to drive that, that they have outreach efforts out in communities um, as well um, until uh, everybody is, is making the right choice. Yes, sir. Question about pediatric vaccinations. Mm -hmm. It's expected this week CDC is going to begin to move to approve vaccinations of the Pfizer vaccine for uh, uh, younger children. Uh, and I'm curious, will the DC vaccination effort take on a, a different look for younger people? Um, you know, obviously we've heard some discussion about maybe getting this to the pediatrician's office, mm -hmm. more familiar surroundings. Uh, can we look for a different look when it comes to the point when CDC finally does free up vaccinations in pediatrics? That's yeah, nice, but. Sure. Isn't that exciting, <laughs> right, that you're 12 and older, will be able to get vaccinated soon. Uh, I know uh, several parents who are very excited about it, especially those parents who have very active student athletes uh, who like to be engaged in a number of sports. Uh, some who will be having their first jobs this summer, whether it be through the Marion Berry SYEP program or otherwise, parents are really excited about this and so are we. Uh, we know that sometimes uh, adults seek care differently for their children than they do for themselves. Uh, Children's National has been a tremendous partner uh, for us during this vaccination effort, already hosting a number of clinics and sessions in the district for 16 and 17 year olds who are currently eligible. We anticipate that they will continue to be a strong and substantial partner for us. I actually can confirm that they will be uh, as we move to uh, 12 year olds. It's also notable that a number of our federally qualified health centers provide care to our young people who are publicly insured with Medicaid and Alliance. They all have the resources on hand uh, to be able to vaccinate 12 to 15 year olds as well. 
uh, an adult who has fewer questions about getting vaccinated may want to ask a healthcare provider at the time of vaccination that they have an established relationship with more questions when it comes to vaccinating their 12 year old, eventually their seven year old, and eventually their you know, 15 month old. Uh, so we will be continuing to move vaccines into a number of different places. That's been our plan since October, uh, and we'll continue to do that. There is a caveat that I wanna make sure I, I communicate here. Vaccine packaging is not explain, expected to change substantially uh, he, before the fall. Uh, so when we get a vial of vaccine that has 10 doses or six doses, et cetera, uh, how our healthcare providers are able to use that vaccine uh, with minimal waste might change. Uh, and we'll have to have some real community thoughtful discussions about how we value vaccinating seven people and potentially not being able to find three more people in that practice during that time period to vaccinate. But it got seven people vaccinated, right? So I, I wanna make sure that folks understand uh, we don't control uh, how vaccine is packaged, how many doses come in a vial, uh, but we do wanna continue to have a substantial commitment for meeting people where they are and where they wanna be served when it comes to getting a dose of vaccine. And on that, doctor, do you have any information as to whether or not the dosage for children will be different than the dosage for adults? Um, I do not, uh, I do not. I know what's in the public domain. Um, I will be following very closely the ACP, ACIP deliberations when they occur uh, to make the clinical recommendations for children 12 to 15. Thank you. But 16 and 17 year olds can get vaccinated now. Let's not forget them. Any other questions? Yes. Um, what about the testing? Are the testing sites shutting down, Dr. Nesbitt? I'm just curious. Uh, F Street, is that still open? So um, thank you for the question, Sam. Uh, when we talk about getting back to normal uh, and everything reopening, uh, there are some large scale public health functions that we may be reimagining as well. Uh, we've launched a host of testing options throughout the district. Uh, you can be tested at large testing venues. You can be tested at fire stations and firehouses. You can be tested uh, at home by retrieving a kit from the public library and putting it in a drop box. As the, as the amount of virus in our community decreases, as the number of fully vaccinated people who are not encouraged to participate in surveillance programs uh, changes, we'll see less demand over time for testing and we're gonna adjust for that. So, uh, but it's still open at the moment. It, if you go over there today, it's open, yes. <laughs> and we'll be sure to communicate when we have any changes around the testing options. Are fewer people showing up at these sites? Yes. Yes. Just two last questions. One is um, I, seeing that other states have uh, reduced their shipment for vaccine supply to the federal government. I wonder, are you still uh, requesting a similar allotment or have you changed um, given demand? Yeah, at the, last week we requested 93% of the vaccine that was available to us. Um, and we'll continue to draw down vaccine. Uh, you all have access to um, administrations versus delivery and you'll see that we've remained uh, doing a pretty swell job at administering what's available in the state allocation. Some of our other partners um, have a lower uh, administration to delivery uh, ratio. Um, but uh, these are all things that are natural progressions of the process, right? There's high demand, limited supply at the beginning, then demand and supply come into equilibrium and eventually supply may outpace demand. Uh, the district still is ordering a substantial amount of our vaccine. We're not one of the states that's only ordering 10, 20% of our vaccine. We've got a lot of all hands on deck efforts that are moving people out to vaccination. The, a day of action on May 1st, another one coming up May 22nd. We've asked all of our CBOs to do them intermittently between now and the 22nd. Uh, we, the mayor highlighted another pop-up that we're having this week. We had a successful pop-up at the Kennedy Center last week. We'll continue to do all of those things as ways of reaching people where they are. And then a last question for the mayor. Uh, so the D DC's Office of Inspector General is auditing the Department of Employment Services over its handling of unemployment insurance. I just, I wanted to get your impression of that audit and like your impressions of how uh, DOES is um, handling the uninsurance program. Um, the OIG does audits all the time. So if this is part of some uh, random um, or general audit, as long as it's not taking uh, the staff away from their very important response work, then we'll, we'll be all for it. But I can uh, gather what it's gonna say. 
is going to say that it's an antiquated system um, that faced a global pandemic uh, and that we need to replace uh, the system. Uh, and we're certainly going to do that. Thank you. Thank you.